Welcome to Final Fantasy XIV, Your First Day. The series meant to help you destroy Eorzea one level at a time. Being new means you don't know what to do first, and there's so many different things to do, but let's try and show you the way. Last time, we spent the day destroying the ecosystem by catching enough fish to feed the country. We need something to do while we wait for the queue to pop, and fishing is just one of many options. But this time, we're finally going to dive into the dungeon and get our first taste of real party content. Don't be nervous, just get going. We have a couple of other things to discuss before getting into the dungeon. The first is food. Here I have an orange juice and five steak. You will notice that food gives stat bonuses for 30 minutes. As a player who is leveling up, this is not at all important. The increased stats aren't all that much. The important part we care about is the 3% increased experience. Dungeon enemies are worth a lot of experience, where overworld enemies are not, so 3% adds up quickly. If you ever need to get food, vendors in town sell very cheap food options for as little as 5 gil per meal. Next up, you can queue for dungeons from anywhere. You don't need to be at the starting location. Here I'm in the Black Shroud, far from Sestasha all the way in Lenosha, and you can still get in. You might gather or craft in queue times, but for this queue, I'll be leveling Conjurer. But when you change classes mid-queue, be careful. When the queue pops, you have 45 seconds to swap back to your original role and accept the queue pop. If you fail to accept in that time limit or withdraw after the queue has filled, you will get a message about a penalty. This works on a three strikes rule. If you fail to accept three times, you will get a 30 minute penalty and not be allowed to use the duty finder at all, even with a pre-made party. This same 30 minute penalty will also be given if you are the first player to abandon a party after entering a dungeon, regardless of the number of strikes. If you get into a dungeon with zero strikes and immediately leave after getting in, you will be barred for 30 minutes. So when you queue, be ready to commit to whatever you are queuing to. The next thing to mention is the Auto Translation Dictionary. Normally when you play, you'll most likely be getting dungeon people who speak your language, at least on the US servers. But there's always those times where you get people of different languages, especially on other servers in other countries. You can still communicate with them by hitting tab on your keyboard while typing. This will bring up the Auto Translation Dictionary. This is a very large collection of words and phrases that will be automatically translated to the language of every player's respective client settings. So if I set my client to use Japanese, Auto Translation would convert all of these into Japanese. So if you get a Japanese player, you can speak Japanese by typing your intended words and phrases, hitting tab, and selecting the entry. Just hope they also know how to use this feature too, or you may still have trouble anyway. Be sure to explore the dictionary if you actually will get to use it. Otherwise, people tend to just use it for the memes. Donut. And while I will be doing all these videos by myself for the most part, you can party up with people for all party content. You never are forced to get random players if you have friends to play with. But finally, it's time to get into our dungeon. Drop whatever you were doing, accept the queue, and get in. Remember to pop a meal when you get inside? I forgot to, but even if I did, I wouldn't use that orange juice I have. Not quite sure where I got that from, but if you have an orange juice, don't use it. Use something else like the stakes. For the absolute basic rundown of how all party content should normally work, tank goes first, everyone follows closely. End of story. 
Things can be a lot more flexible when you enter a duty with a party of friends, but with random people, respect each other and let the tank lead. Many tanks have tanxiety and need all the help they can get. Advise each other and listen to advice yourself. Also, make liberal use of sprint, especially if you fall behind the group for whatever reason. Sprint is really useful. Do it. That aside, all dungeons follow the same basic flow. Groups of enemies, called trash mobs in varying group sizes, along a fairly linear path leading up to a boss encounter. Do this three times and the dungeon is cleared. Dungeons can change things up here or there, but this is the general basic way of things. Along the way, and also after every boss, there are treasure chests that will give the party loot. In the notifications area, or by interacting with the chest, you can open the loot window. All players share this loot pool. Any individual loot will be dropped immediately into your inventory. There are three buttons here, Need, Greed, and Pass. Need will only be lit up if you can wear the piece of gear, or otherwise use it in some way. As a Lancer, I cannot need on any healer gear, even if I have a level 80 healer. It's based on your current class. The order of operations goes as follows. Need, Greed, and then drop to the floor. Need rolls are prioritized above all others. If a player can use something, the game wants to make sure that it goes to someone who will appreciate the item. Pressing the button will give you a random number from 1 to 99. If multiple people roll need, each player's number is compared and the highest number wins. If people rolled greed, those will be ignored if even one person rolled need. Only needs will be rolled. Greed rolls only work if nobody presses the need button. It works the same way though. Everyone who clicked greed will get a number from 1 to 99. Whoever rolled highest wins the item. And if nobody rolled and everyone passes on the item, it will automatically be dropped to the floor and destroyed. Further, if you roll on every piece of loot available, the window will automatically close, but you can bring it back up before everyone rolls. You can still click pass and forfeit your loot roll, but you cannot change from a need to a greed, or vice versa. And if you originally passed, you can't take a roll afterwards. If you win the item, the item will automatically appear in your inventory, and a victory jingle will play. At this stage, gear is no better than the novice hall gear, but when we get into later dungeons, you're going to want to nab up every piece of gear you get, so press that need button. As a more general talk of Sustasha, this is a very basic dungeon that acts as a tutorial in many ways. Interacting with stuff, killing certain special enemies, and for bosses the theme is additional enemies or adds. Adds basically encompass all enemies or targets that appear that aren't the main boss. The first boss doesn't appear until summoned. The second has two guards to start. The third will summon a large group of dogs midway through. And the final boss has a special interaction mechanic that you can safely and completely ignore due to how fast the boss dies. That is a theme of a lot of early content you'll see. Even when this was new, it was pretty easy to ignore the ads, but a lot of other mechanics instances throw at you can end up being skipped completely due to the slow and inevitable changes made to the game. But make it a note to pay attention to things as the game is attempting to teach you. But something most important you should get used to having now is the Limit Break action. It's over in your general actions menu, so put this somewhere where you can use it. Here we have the Limit Break bar slowly fill as you fight. When maxed out, you may perform a Limit Break. This bar is shared by the entire party. If one person uses Limit Break, the bar is emptied for everyone. 
and each roll has a different kind of limit break. Melee DPS has a powerful single target hit. Range DPS have to aim a thin line AoE in the direction they are facing. Magic DPS place an aimed circle AoE. Healers do percentage based healing to all party members around them. And tanks do a defensive buff to all players around them. The vast, vast majority of times we want to be using Limit Break for DPS. Where possible, Magic and Ranged DPS should be the ones doing it. Especially if you get a tank who pulls a lot of enemies. Early on, it's rare to get a tank who will pull literally the entire dungeon. But in these cases, look how many enemies this guy has gathered up. Limit Break would absolutely decimate these enemies. In later dungeons, this becomes much more common a tactic, so ranged and mage LBs will get a lot of usage. For example, let's say a ranged limit break will do 1000 potency to all enemies hit. Your typical AoE attack from a ranged DPS will be between 100 and 200 potency. That's way less than the limit break. Further, Let's say the melee limit break is 2500 potency on one enemy. Three enemies hit by that 1000 potency AoE is now stronger than melee limit break. As such, ranged should be using their limit breaks on trash mobs where possible. Meanwhile, if the melee LB is the one getting used, save it for bosses or otherwise enemies that have a huge health pools which are quite rare. A further reason for maged and ranges to be using the limit break is because of a common misconception players seem to have. Trash is more dangerous than most bosses. People tend to expect the opposite. Bosses will be the more dangerous opponent. Sometimes this is true, but more often than not, Trash mobs are the real dangers of dungeons. This is especially pronounced in those cases where the tank pulls the entire dungeon at once. What sounds more dangerous to you? 20 enemies or one big one? Tanks and healers should avoid limit break in most cases. They have their uses, but it's rare. If the party is taking heavy damage and standing in AoEs all the time, these limit breaks will get used more often. Just hope it doesn't come to that though. Much later on in the game, there are mechanics that upon failing them, will damage the entire party by quite a lot of damage. A tank limit break would reduce this by a lot. Other times failing a mechanic will reduce your healing potency. Percentage based healing, like from a limit break, would get around this. We'll also come back to these once we hit 8 man content. But one last note on Limit Break, the final boss of the dungeon will extend the Limit Break bar to two sections. Limit Breaks come in three levels of power, and each is much stronger than the last. In early dungeons, you're extremely unlikely to see Limit Break 2, even in the worst situations. But later on, you might see some use of it. An LB3... You won't have a chance to use this for a very long time. That just about covers everything for dungeons in general. One last point I'll make is that if you need to kick a player, you can do so by opening the party window and selecting the player's name. The randomly chosen party leader will then get a pop-up to invite a new player into the dungeon. People can join instances in progress so losing someone mid-instance is not the end of the world. If you want to be able to enter dungeons mid-instance to help people fill spots when they lose players, look in the duty finder and click the gear in the top left. Finish the dungeon together and remember to give your commendation to a player you felt did a good job. Like the other bosses, more chests will give you more gear and you will get a special duty clear reward. No matter what items dropped from chests, one random gear piece you don't already own and can currently use 
will be placed directly in your inventory. This is how all dungeons classified as leveling dungeons work. You will always gain at least one piece of gear from completion, unless you already own the entire set. Then you'll get nothing. But as I said, these first three dungeons are all going to be gear basically exactly the same as what you got from the novice hall, but a different color. Either way, you'll be dropped outside the same place as where you entered the dungeon from. This isn't true for all instances, so if you randomly get transported to the entrance of the dungeon, it's because you advanced a quest. Return to the quest giver, get your big thanks, and unlock the party finder. Using this, you can put up or join people's requests for parties to be put together for content. For the most part, this is for harder content. We'll come back to this later, but know it's here, and also go into the options menu in the party finder menu and turn off the advanced search results in the log option. Trust me, it's way better this way. Ultimately, our next set of quests is going to have us traveling back and forth across all three city-states. Now is the time to start making heavy use of home points, favored destinations, and free destinations. Home points is what return takes you to, as we already know. Your free destination is only possible to take if you have a security token, which you can set up through the Square Enix site. Favored destinations, meanwhile, are the big draw here. You can choose three destinations to be favored, and you can change them at will. Setting a destination as favored will drop the cost of the teleport by half. If it originally cost 200 gil, it will now cost 100 gil. And remember, costs are determined by distances. The further you get from your destination, the more money you end up saving. If Limsa isn't your home point, make it a favored destination now. Same for our next destination, Gridania. While we are here, be sure to stop into the Carpenter's Guild and pick up the one item for Beauty is Only Scalp Deep that we started last time. Then we can head out to the next dungeon. It all follows the same general pattern of Sestasha, but something else unlocked in our Duty Roulette section. Leveling Roulette. This is the most important roulette you are going to ever do. Starting from level 16, that's the unlock level, not the level of the roulette, all the way up to max level, this is the biggest source of EXP in the game. But something I didn't mention about roulettes before is that they are a daily thing. You can do the roulette as many times as you want, but only once a day will the roulette itself give you its extra reward. Leveling roulette specifically gives a ton of EXP. You are probably already very overleveled like I am, so there's really no reason to do it now. But there is currently a 50-50 chance that Tam Terra is the dungeon you will get out of this. Because all dungeons classified as leveling dungeons are in this roulette just from unlocking them. So right now, leveling roulette is only Sestasha and Tam Terra Decroft. A 50-50 chance to not only progress the story, but also gain a ton of EXP. If you don't mind being even more overleveled, it's a chance worth taking now. Personally, you might want to start a second class just to use this EXP on for now. We'll talk more about this at the end of the video. For now, do the dungeon and turn in the quest afterwards and pay attention to this important side plot. It's never important to the main story, but trust me on this one. Either way, we end up over in Ulda, stop by the Alchemist Guild for another piece of the side quest, and then back to story progression. For the third time in a row, but for the last time for a bit, we'll get another leveling dungeon. This too will be in the roulette. But welcome to Copper Bell Mines! I hope you like standing around a lot. 
I mean a lot. A lot. But after beating it, congrats on getting through your starter dungeons. There's a high chance that at least one of these dungeons will have dropped something called a faded copy. This is the dungeon's music, but you can't use it. You'll have to get a crafter to turn it into the finished product for you. Upon using the actual music roll, you can use the orchestrion in your in-room to listen to the track at will, and even open the entire game's available music scrolls with Control plus O. Unfortunately, there is not a music roll for every track in the game. Ignoring that, completion of the dungeon did not complete the quest. This time we have one more thing to do, a solo duty. But completion of this will greatly advance the story and introduce us to the Scions of the Seventh Dawn. This is going to be your main ally through the game, so get used to them. But before we go meet them, let's take a few detours. The first is, if you really want to change your hair right now, head back to Limsa if you remembered to grab the two pieces from Gridania and Ulda. If you have patience, we'll be coming back to Limsa later. Upon bringing all three requested items, we discover... Is that a JoJo reference? Oh my god! I don't actually think it is, but this man is blatantly fabulous in all the... ways. For good reason, though, as he is our hairdresser. Head to the inn now and use the crystal bell to summon him anytime you need to get your hair did. It's not the full character creator, but it does allow for a good amount of hair and tattoo changing. Another thing we have now is specifically from completing Into a Copper Hell. Back in Gridania is this evil guy here who has the house that Death built. This is the unlock for Palace of the Dead, a very special instance with its own leveling system that does give you actual EXP for doing it. This deserves an entire dedicated video though, so look forward to that one. For now, enjoy the following tip. People often crowd around NPCs and make them impossible to click. The NPC to get into Palace of the Dead is one of them. Hold X on the keyboard to activate click-through. Players will not be clickable while holding down the X key, but NPCs will still be clickable. Keep this in mind for events and any and all new content, because players tend to group up a lot and make it impossible to click the NPCs. With those out of the way, let's head back to Copper Bell Mines, past it through Horizon, and beyond. When we reach Vesper Bay, we have more side unlocks. This lady on the bench is your entry into the end game, Glamour. She has two quests. The first unlocks dies. She wants an orange juice. Remember when I said I wouldn't use that orange juice I have? Not quite sure where I got that from, but if you have an orange juice, don't use it. Use something else like the steaks. Well, now you know why I said that. If you don't have one, the vendor 10 feet away sells orange juice. The other quest she has is the ability to glamour and use the glamour dresser. Said dresser is in the inn, and this dresser is the real way you should be glamming. Let's start with dyes, though. Dyes are simple. If you have a dye, you can color a piece of gear that color, but not all gear can be dyed. Look at the icon of your gear. In the top right of the gear piece's icon, if there is a circle, then you can dye the armor. And this dot is the currently applied dye. It will change color based on whatever color the item is. Each dyeing of an item will spend a dye item. They're consumables, so keep that in mind when you want to do a lot of dyeing. If you have five pieces of gear, you need five dye. Glamours, meanwhile, are a bit more... expansive. Rule 1, you cannot glamour stronger gear onto weaker gear. If a piece of gear is level 80 and you are wearing a level 70 piece of gear, you cannot glamour the 70 piece of gear to look like the level 80 piece. You have to just equip the level 80 piece. Rule 2, you have to be able to wear the gear, 
role restrictions and level restrictions and etc. apply. You can't be a dragoon that wears white mage armor. Roll 3. Glamour prisms are also consumable, which is why the glamour dresser will be much more important. Roll 4. A glamoured item will have a plus in the top right where dies go. If it's this weird pink plus, the glamoured item is not dyeable. Otherwise, it contains the colour of the dye. Now, on to the dresser and glamour plates. To start, to put an item into the glamour dresser, it costs one glamour prism each. But that's a one-time cost for infinite uses within the dresser. If you glam yourself 500 different times using the dresser, it still only ever costs you that one prism for that one item. You can also remove that item for free at any time. Next, remember the armor I mentioned being able to carry special items and event gear. The glamour dresser can pull from the armor for free. So special event items as glam don't cost any glamour prisms. The dresser can store up to 400 items for now. Now comes the fun part, creating the glamour plates. Pick a plate to use and throw gear into each of the slots. The same rules of glamour apply. Role and race and gender and level restrictions all apply. You have 15 plates you can make, which means you can have 15 different glamour sets created at one time, as of this video at least. Both the size of the dresser and the number of plates and the places where you can use plates have been on the list of things for the devs to increase so you may have more access later. But as you can see, I only have one plate to play with because I used all the rest, allowing each roll of mine to have different glams. And also, you can place a die on glamour plates if you say, want to use the same gloves on three different plates, but each time have a different color of glove? Let's take a pair of mage gloves, for example. The plate for your red mage will dye them red, summon it purple, and black mage will have them black, each time using a different plate with a different dye. Upon putting together your outfit on the plate, save it and exit the dresser. Next, go to your gear set list, and right click a gear set. Find the link to glamour plate button, link the plate you just made to your gear set, and you are done. Glamour plates will only apply in main towns, but swapping to your gear set will automatically apply the glam to every piece of gear glammed. Best shown off here with me swapping back and forth between this random gunbreaker set I made for you. Both sets use the same set of gear, but I'm using two different plates, and they are both instantly applying. You'll need to collect a lot of glamour prisms if you collect a lot of glamour pieces you want to use, but it's absolutely worth abusing the dresser as much as you can. It is truly the best thing to happen to glamour in this game. Just remember it only works in towns. If you are in a field and try to apply the glamour plate, you're not going to get the glam. With that page long detour over with, let's get back to the story again. You may notice a bunch of other blue quests available around me. That's mostly because of Fisher being level 51. I can't actually do any of these quests. They're all dungeons, so keep that in mind if you did like I did and then go and speak to the final boss of the game, Zodiai Mean Tataru. Head further in and turn in the quest. From those three dungeons you just did, you probably collected a lot of gear you don't need on top of the novice hall gear. Every time you level a new class, be sure to always keep your gear up to date as best you can. But here, I am just focusing on one or two only. So none of these quest rewards are all too good for me, except for the Allegan pieces. You've probably gotten a lot of these by now. The tooltip does not lie. These exist purely for selling. 
I did not mention it yet and wanted to be sure I did, since it's a common question I see. Especially because Minfili here is going to unlock us our next and probably most important feature and is highly connected to money making. We finally have retainers. If we bought the game. Free trial players are out of luck. But for the rest of us, we just gained big inventory. Before worrying about going to the NPCs the active help tells us about, pick up the next story quest. And also before we leave for retainers, take a note to the other reward we got from the last quest. A bunch of Vesper Bay teleport tickets. Put these in a safe place for what we're about to do next. These tickets will save you a lot of time and we don't want to accidentally throw these away. To start, which retainer vocate you'd use does not matter. Choose the one you want. They will always be hanging around the market areas. These NPCs will allow you to hire retainers. Two of them. I can hire three because I pay an extra $2 a month for it. But at this point you can have like 10 retainers across all sources of them but you don't need more than the two with proper inventory management. Two retainers is plenty. The thing many people may love is that retainer creation is a full character creator. You can even save the creations like when you created your character originally. For the same reasons of playing Hrothgar, I will make a Viera retainer because she can't wear hats. And then I remembered I will probably never show retainers again after this, and that reason becomes pointless. Upon completion, you'll get to choose a personality for your retainer. This is purely flavor text choices, so pick the one you want. And you can even buy retainer Fantasia off the market board to go through the process again later. The final step is picking a name. Each retainer must have a unique name, so if you try like me to name her Donut, it won't work. I attempted to prove the point a second time with Donut with an H and it worked, I guess, which surprised me. So now I have a bunny named Donut. Okay. Before I hire more, let's explore the options we have. To start, our retainer has 175 inventory spaces, which is even bigger than our normal inventory's 140. Next, we have selling items on the market board. The entire reason I advise you to keep all the fish you caught in the last video. You have 20 slots to sell stuff per retainer. There's an active help about market board taxes, but as of this video, all areas have a market tax. This is due to massive inflation of gill and isn't likely to go away anytime soon. Choose an item to sell and click the icon in the top right of the pricing window to open the current market listing. Even if an item doesn't seem like it would be worth all that much, put it up to be sold. I started this video with around 10,000 gil. By the end, I will have nearly 120,000. That's between money the story gives me and several thousands in sales across my retainers. It does add up. Above the selling option is the interest and withdraw guild option. There's no real reason to keep money on your retainers unless you are guild capped, which is 1 billion, so good luck there. Or maybe you are bad at budgeting and they will save you from spending every penny you have. Anytime your retainer sells an item, the money will go here. Finally is the sale history button. If you ever come across like 100,000 gil on your retainer and have no idea what that came from, it'll tell you who gave this gift of money and what they bought off of you. Either way, if you have the items to sell, fill every slot your retainers have. I threw fish and bait into all 60 slots I had. The rest I have I want to sell and isn't worth enough for the markets I throw at the nearby vendor. The rest of the inventory is gear that I put into the armory chest instead, some potions, and some crafting items. I will be going over crafters in a future video, so let's give these items to Donut to hold. 
here's a quick before and after of my inventory and just goes to show how much this helps. But again, if you're a free trial player, I feel for you. If you even try to get into crafting, you're going to be in hell. And it's not going to be a good hell because all the cat girls are gone. But we're not done. Near the Aetherite in any of the three main towns is the quest, An Ill-Conceived Venture. You can only do one of them, but all three are the same quest. Go to the marked location, kill some enemies to save a retainer, and turn in the quest for Ventures. Ventures are like mini-missions for your retainers to go and find items for you. To have them do so, you must assign them a class. You can only assign them classes you yourself know, and also they can't outlevel you. For example, as a level 20 Lancer, making Dona a Lancer, she can't get past level 20 until I do. So this incentivizes you making them to be similar classes as to you. I especially advise having a battle retainer for crafting reasons, or selling to other crafter reasons. Monster drops can be very lucrative. So I make her a lancer and give her one of my old spears. If you didn't keep your old weapons, it's easy and cheap to get a new one. Retainers can't go on ventures without a weapon in hand. I attempt to give her more gear too, fail basically, and pick a venture for her. We have two options to start. Hunting, which are short hour long hunts for specific items, specifically monster drops, and later on it can become extremely unreasonable to farm monsters for drops. Having a retainer farm for you for a day and then doing your craft project the next day saves you a lot of time. The other option, the thing I will be doing, is field exploration. These are long 18 hour ventures for big EXP. Basically, your retainer can't do any other ventures for a whole day, but they're worth big EXP at a low venture cost. It costs two ventures to do one, but it's potentially the cheapest on your ventures, which can be expensive until you get to higher levels. The reward is random based on the exploration you do, but it's a nice chunk of EXP. The first time will be worth a five whole levels, and the higher the level you get your retainer, the more options you have. But you'll be expected to gear up your retainers to do higher level ventures, so handing down gear is a really good thing. Also at level 10, you unlock quick ventures which are random rewards, but are potentially the best EXP gains for retainers. It just costs a lot of ventures, which you currently do not have a lot of. And ultimately, and most importantly, your retainers continue to sell while on ventures. As long as you are not currently talking to the retainer, they are always selling their listed items. For a week. If for whatever reason you ignore your retainers for a week, or don't play for a week, they will stop selling their items. But unless you stop playing or something, you're probably going to check them daily. Whew! That was a big thing, but you'll be glad you invested into learning about retainers as you continue the story. Keep an eye out for when the game randomly notifies you of a sale. Yes, the game notifies you in real time when you make money. Though I didn't find any footage of that happening, but this does happen. Anyway, our first task as a Scion is to head to Drybone and play Batman. Batman who carries around several day old corpses. This will be a regular thing, mind you. For better or for worse, we're gonna continue to play with the bodies, kill some lizard men, and get our next equipment based quest. Remember this? We cannot do it without wearing some trashy gear, but it's okay, we have our fancy weapon and gloves and helmet if Hrothgar could wear them. But after the scene at the Oasis, we can hit our gear set button to put on our normal gear, and use the first of our Vesper Bay tickets. We will pray return to the Waking Sands over and over and over again 
for one reason or another. This is why I emphasized early to make sure you put them in a safe place when doing our retainer management, as it saves you a lot of time to have these. Sometimes they're kind of wastes of trips, but this time is for teaching you yet another feature. This one not too important yet. It's Materia. Materia are special stones that grant you further stats on your gear for shoving them in. To get your first Materia, talk to the nearby NPC to learn Materia Extraction. Something I've not mentioned yet is Spirit Bond. By using your gear at all, you'll get messages about your gear spirit binding to you. This just means they are no longer sellable to other players. You can't use some million gill piece of gear, be done with it, and sell it to the next person. Don't worry, unless you're some high-end game raider, you shouldn't be buying anything that expensive. More importantly though is 100% Spirit Bond. Hovering your mouse over your gear, you have two bars in the tooltip. The right bar is durability and how long until the item breaks. The left one is current spirit bond. At 100% you can extract a piece of materia from most pieces of gear. The bar will have turned white when it has happened. You also get materia based on the gear type. So here in this clip I extract from all my fisher gear and get a bunch of gatherer materia instead of battle materia. Come back here later to learn about transmutation, which isn't really useful, and as a crafter to learn how to meld your own gear. But until you become a crafter, you have two options. Get a friend or otherwise player who actually crafts to meld for you, or find the melded NPCs in town, denoted by the materia and hammer icon. For a nominal fee, they can shove that stone into a piece of gear that has slots. That's any piece of gear that has these green circles. Dungeon gear tends not to have any slots ever. But this is not enough, because notice at the bottom of the melding window is a list of stats and their maximum values. You can't shove an infinite amount of a stat into our piece of gear, even with slots. The eye level of a piece of gear determines the stat maximums, so even if I had two pieces of critical hit materia, I could only use this one piece. This isn't too important early on as a battle class, but if you feel like melding, go ahead. Just don't bother throwing money at the market board just to meld your gear. You may also remove melded materia at any time from anywhere. You don't need a special NPC to do it. Just right click and extract. Materia done and gone, we pray return to Doth Sands of the Wokeness to get our first coffer. Coffers will always contain gear, but the gear it contains will vary greatly depending on the coffer. This one here is a weapon coffer that will give a weapon of the designated level based on your current class. So this one will give me a lance that I am already wearing stat wise, that I also could have gotten from my class quest. Not sure why this is a thing, honestly. Maybe to force you to upgrade your gear if you've been ignoring class quests and didn't get a drop from dungeons before this. But you really should be doing a class quest and make this another reminder to be doing so. But now we have one of the most important story events. We're gonna set up an ambush, fail miserably, and be captured. Welcome to the safety cave. Talk to the NPC to unlock your first trial, and note this NPC over near the pool of water. You are not trapped in here. If you need to leave, you can leave the safety cave at will to do whatever you might need to do before tackling your first trial. Trials are essentially boss fights. While dungeon bosses can put up some real fights, there are nothing next to actual trials. There are no trash mobs, but there can be ads. The entire instance is dedicated to this one fight. Watch the scenes for some very important story implications, and then take down Ifrit. Remember your training. All three dungeons prior to this had some form of training, mostly about ads. Ifrit won't put up much of a fight in general, 
if anything is going to wipe your party, it's the Infernal Nail ad. If you fail to kill it within the invisible time limit, it's an instant party wipe. But for as easy as he is, he's meant to be. This is the first trial only, and the next one won't be so easy. Remember the mechanics you just saw if your memory is good though, as you'll need that knowledge later. But for now, we get dropped off at Drybone no matter where we were because of how the story went. We'll get some more lore and story development and be sent back to pray return to the Waking Sands, but on the way in, we'll pass by Nedric Ironheart. This gentleman and scholar and miner will be giving us a lot of dungeons as you can see from my quest options. For us, we want Hello Halatali and to ignore the other two before heading into the Waking Sands. If you don't mind the detour, go turn this in after leaving the Waking Sands. This is the next dungeon for leveling roulette, but don't bother doing it now. We'll come back to this very soon. But for defeating a primal single-handedly, our party members in this case will just for gameplay, we have gained some fame within the Grand Companies of Eorzea. Grand Companies are the de facto armies of the three city-states, and we have no choice but to join one of them. There are no major story effects based on your choice. At most, if talking to a member of the Immortal Flames as a member of the Immortal Flames, they will address you by rank. The only changes otherwise are glamour based. Choose the one that speaks to you, even if your new friends Alpha No and Alize may dissuade you. All three have their ups and all three have their downs. Personally, despite the spin he puts on it, a spin all three companies put on their pitches, Raubon himself speaks to me. He feels the most honest in his pitch, the most passionate, and that was before I even learned his backstory. I will say this, I am sure all three mean well, but my bias is not without merit, but neither will yours lack merit. Again, pick the one that truly speaks to you, and you can't go wrong. When all three pitches are said and done, return to the sands and make your choice. As said, I am going to be a member of the Flames. Head to their grand company kiosk to enlist, but before you can, you have to go on a rescue mission. This rescue mission is the same, no matter which group you chose, just the location changes. Kill the big robot and get back to enlisting. If any piece of info was more important than the rest, more important than even retainers, it's your grand company and what they can do for you. Pick up the next story quest and complete it for 300 grand company seals. This is important because of the quest next to you. You have been informed that My Little Chocobo is a required story quest by technical accounts. So go turn in the story quest and pick up the next extremely important story quest I'll talk about in a minute, self-management. For your grand companies, with your 300 seals you just got, you can talk to the quartermaster and buy Chocobo Insurance Permit for only 200 seals. Follow the quest to the destination, turn it in, name your chocobo, and finally, after all this time, learn how to use mounts. While mounted, you can manually click off the mount buff to dismount. Otherwise, the unsheathing weapon button is a dismount button, so the Z key for keyboard players if you didn't change it. I won't be using my chocobo usually. I have two favorited mounts, both of them because I've been a long-term player. A big old dragon raid boss and a blue carbuncle. Perks of being a vet. But back to the many other perks and things your grand company have. To start is supply and provisioning missions. Supply missions are for crafters and provisioning missions are for gatherers. As you can see from my Fisher entry. It's based on the current level of your class. So because I only have Fisher, only that appears. You can do it once a day, and it can be a good source of Grand Company seals, and also worth a lot of experience points. High quality is worth double experience points and Grand Company seals. There's also expert delivery, but we don't get that for a long time. I'll mention it at level 50, 
just know to keep all of your dungeon drops if you have the space for them. Next up is the hunt log. Yes, your grand company has a hunt log, and it's worth a lot of company seals. And especially important is the fact that Halatali is a listed location for some of these enemies. If you want to do Halatali, do it now instead of before doing your grand company. Two birds with one stone. Because we will need a lot of grand company seals to rank up within our grand company. The first upgrade alone is 2,000 seals, but rank ups are very useful. For one, a higher rank means more shop options from the quartermaster. We also get a higher cap on grand company seals. Our base cap is only 10,000, but by the rank of second lieutenant, it's 50,000. The next two ranks beyond that bring us to 80,000 and 90,000 seals. And that is all important because of two of our previous unlocks, Glamour and Ventures. You can buy Glamour Prisms, Dispellers, and Retainer Ventures here. There's a lot else to buy too, but you can explore the shop at your own leisure. Before I get off Grand Companies though, go kill a fate now. Before we only got Gil and Experience Points. Now we get some seals out of it too. Also, there's some battle leaves that give seals too, but I mean the, the battle leaves, they're terrible, absolutely terrible. Why would you do battle leaves? But now back to why silk management was so important. In the footage of dancing you see and I am looping because it made me laugh to loop as many times as I am showing you, I am about to hit level 29 and at level 30 we can get our class's job. But if we have not completed self management, we cannot do our first job quest. I'll talk about jobs towards the end, but this specific quest is the trigger to open jobs. So even if you somehow grinded to max level and ignored the story, the story just prevented you from being as strong as you could be. But now for the real purpose of this clip. The fact I am dancing at these sylphs. Forward slash commands exist for all emotes, and there are many more quests that expect you to do this. Make sure you don't have anything before the forward slash or you'll type it as part of your chat. If the emote doesn't work, double check your typing, because you're probably spamming a chat somewhere otherwise. Also, you only have to type it once. Instead of typing the command over and over, hit enter to start the chat, then hit up on the arrow keys to quickly cycle to the last thing you typed. This speeds up your need to dance over and over, or do other emotes over and over as quests require. And for finishing this quest, you will get a bunch of notices. You'll get mount speed bonuses. This is based on story progress too, and you can check the areas you have boosts for by opening the travel menu. Don't worry about all these empty stars, the game will get you all the speed you should care about for free. Even so, the upgrade to speed is not at all small, so when you get a notice about speed boosts, you'll be greatly appreciating it. But while we're here near Gridania, we have another thing we can unlock. The sightseeing log. It will give you a tutorial example of how to do them, and then give you the log. It's a book of riddles that you must figure out the locations of. Time and weather both play a part, much like fishing. If you want to do more beyond this unlock, I recommend finding a good tracker or guide. I will put one of them in the description, but there are plenty of trackers that will do enough otherwise. Pick the one you like the most. More importantly is the quest completion location, Apkalu Falls. Over the last 20 levels, you've gotten a ton of achievements completed. Jonathus here is your one-stop shop for all achievement-based rewards. Based on your accumulated achievement points, you'll get currency. One per 50 points, I believe. There's a bunch of minions and mounts you can buy here, but also some achievements automatically unlock some kind of reward for completing, which includes items. These items are never automatically given. 
you have to come back to Jonathus to pick up the item if you unlocked something you really wanted to have. But finally, finally after all this time, we can slow down on important features. From 20 to 24, there's basically nothing otherwise noteworthy. The Thousand Maws of Todorak is not noteworthy for the dungeon itself, but for the final boss fight. Some stuff in A Realm Reborn had a bad habit of putting long cutscenes in bad places. There's a two and a half minute cutscene at the end of this dungeon, and as you are ready to fight the final boss. If you get a party that isn't patient or otherwise accommodating to newbies, they may start the boss fight without you. I apologize on their behalf if they do. Luckily, you can't be locked out of boss fight arenas like you would normally be. You'll be allowed to teleport in because you were in cutscene. You are only locked out if you died and resurrected outside the arena, or refused the teleport into the arena originally. Our next point of note isn't until level 28. Sometimes, but very rarely, the main story quest will split in two. There is no reason not to pick up both quests at once, as both must be done. This is not like the choice of Grand Company, where there were three quests but you could only pick one of those. One of these quests is also a weird item throw quest. There's going to be a lot of these, and this is how mage limit breaks work, and how some skills work. Get used to this targeting system because it's going to be used a lot. But now we're gonna get to head to the next main dungeon, Hawk Manor. You're probably already level 30, so there's a number of different things you should take care of first. To start in Gridania is a quest at the Aetherite to open a third exit. This is White Wolf Gate, and it will exit to the upper section of the Central Shroud, around level 30 enemies. This was locked for that specific reason. This is a shortcut to Hawkman's location. While you should do other things first before this dungeon, I will quickly mention there's one special thing to know in Hawk Manor. After the second boss, you need to return to the beginning of the dungeon. Aptly named, use Return. Instead of taking you to your home point, it takes you to the dungeon entrance. If it's on cooldown, inform your party of such and run back to the beginning manually. The first boss unlocked a shortcut so it's not too long a trip, but using return here is extremely commonplace and does save a little bit of time. But this is the only time this kind of thing is relevant, barring extenuating circumstances. You'll never have to use return in a dungeon again unless you want to. Now for the important bits unlocked at level 30. Down in Fulgord Float, it took me like 10 times to say that, is a quest your main scenario guide will warn you of, my feisty little chocobo. This will give you access to the companion feature. By feeding your chocobo Gishel Greens, he will fight for you. From this point forward, there's no reason to do overworld quests without your companion by your side. Writing a mount pauses the timer so you will get 30 actual minutes of time with them, not wasting it on travel. Let's look at the companion menu quick. To start is Barding. These are purely visual, but there are a lot of glamour options for your chocobo to collect. Go kill some enemies and open the menu again. We have a skills page and now one skill point. I recommend banking everything into the healer tree. Tank Chocobo tends not to even help me as a healer, so I just have him heal while I DPS as a healer. But maybe Tank will help you if you're a healer. No matter what though, pick one tree. You can eventually max out all of the trees, but without special circumstances and a lot of gill, you can only max out one of the trees. So pick one and stick to it until level 10 for your chocobo. Just don't make it a DPS. Survival is more important than speed because a death is more costly than the low damage you'll do. 
there is a way to reset your Chocobo's trees, but we won't get to that until level 50. Finally, be sure to use the Actions tab to force them into the stance of the skill you got them. Otherwise, they'll attempt to do all three rolls at once with not great results. And just as important is the quest completion reward, the Chocobo Saddlebag. You cannot open this inside of instances, but in the overworld you can open it anytime, even if your Chocobo is not summoned. This is an extra 70 spaces of inventory for stuff you want to keep on you, but serves no purpose in dungeons or just at will. And free trial people can even get this. Before leaving Bent Branch, I recommend buying a bunch of Gishel Greens from the nearby vendor. Most vendors, as you explore, will carry these, but now is a good time to invest, and they're pretty cheap. Now for the big event. Before heading into Hawk Manor, go do all remaining class quests. Every class quest line ends with a final battle to test your learning, but it won't take too long to defeat your opponent and get another class quest based skill. And more importantly, you have another quest you can do. Your first job quest. Your reward is a stone and another skill. Meet your new teachers and welcome to your new world of having a job. Jobs are direct upgrades to classes and there is only one job per class, with Arcanist being the exception for now but may also follow this soon depending on what 6.0 brings. Open your inventory, equip your stone, and save the gear set. There are almost no reasons to take off your job stone from this point on. There are only two exceptions I can think of, and they last for about five minutes each. The first, conjurers and only conjurers have a special mount quest they can do after finishing their class quests. This means white mages cannot do this quest. The other is getting your job quests as an arcanist because of it having two jobs. You will have to take the stone off to do the other job quest if you only did one of them. And yes, I did level both of these classes to 30 just to prove the point. You are very welcome. All other reasons that aren't memes with friends, don't do it. Keep your stone on. Look at your skill list if you need a reason. There are a lot of new skills you can get. Also, be ready to redo your hotbars, because in my example, Dragoon is not a lancer. It has its own set of hotbars just like other classes have. But given we're so early on and don't have a lot of skills, this is an easy fix. Beyond this, having a job unlocks us something. The ability to do PvP. Classes are blatantly and literally not allowed to do PvP content. You have to be a job. Head over to your grand company and there will be a quest from the commander. A pup no longer. We'll have to head far south and lower Lenosha. If you didn't start in this town, this will be a good opportunity to get the Aetherite Crystal. Talk to the boat NPC and head over to the Wolves' Den. You'll notice all of your hotbars have been screwed up. This is normal. PvP has its own set of hotbars. Your skill sets in PvE and PvP are completely different sets of skills with PvP typically being much more condensed to allow for focusing on the field. Take a moment to place return and teleport into good positions like in your PvE hotbars and go finish the quest. This will unlock the feast, small scale 4v4 battles. Head outside and talk to the Gobby, who will have larger scale 24v24 team battles for rival wings. This is a much more complex mode than Feast, having MOBA-style mechanics of pushing lanes, collecting resources, and summoning giant robots to take down the enemy base. But if you're looking for something massive in scale, but much easier to do and slam your face against your screen to maybe win, 
we have front lines back at our grand company. This is even larger, being 3-way 24v24v24 24v24 battles for objectives. That's 72 players. There could be some heavy strategy employed to get easy victories, but typically just become giant wolves of Zerg. But it's still something to at least try and maybe even enjoy. I myself don't do PvP all that much, but I will look into doing a PvP video in future if you all are interested in such. Though more likely it will be two videos since Rival Wings is that big. One word of warning though, Rival Wings is dead at the best of times, at least on US servers. Every week though, players hold the Revival Wings event to drum up participation. If you want to participate, look this up. People who do like PvP of the game rave about Rival Wings and how fun it is, so it may be worth learning. But before we call it a day, let's speak of the armory bonus now that we are level 30. I mentioned leveling Conjurer and Arcanist to 30 for those two clips. It's actually not all that hard to do now with how many bonuses we have available to us. Look at my EXP gains as I kill these enemies on Conjurer. Plus 160% experience points. You should be getting plus 130%. A level 1 class can use the brand new ring from the Novice Hall, and for having a higher level class, you get an automatic plus 100% EXP. The other 30% I get is from the special earring I have been using from pre-ordering Shadowbringers. This is the power of the armory bonus. Just from having a higher level battle class, your lower level ones get EXP bonuses. My Dragoon is level 36 here, so Chondra will get bonuses until hitting level 36 itself. From 1 to 70, the armory bonus is 100% XP. But the last 10 levels are worth 50%. So when the level cap increases again, it will be 1 to 80 will be plus 100%, and 80 to 90 will be 50% more EXP for kills. This will help get past that level 1 to 15 hump to get up to dungeoning levels by quite a lot, since dungeons are worth the most experience points. But that's it for what's important from levels 15 to 30. That was surprisingly a lot more than I expected. I thought this would be shorter than the first 15 levels, but here you go. I hope you like a lot of features, and I hope I accurately explain them all in a way you can now understand them. But before we start the next arc of the game, we're going to take another break to learn the ins and outs of gathering as a miner and botanist. Thanks for watching Final Fantasy XIV, your first day. Check the playlist in the description and the card on screen for other episodes. I truly did not expect this one to be as long as it became. But the things we experienced do all warrant mentioning and explaining, yet still leaves room for entire videos about other subjects. But that's neither here nor there. As I said, Next time we're going to explore the other side of the wonderful world of Gathering. Hope to see you there, and may the power of Ananid Hogs lay waste to your enemies. And an extra special thanks to my September patrons over on Patreon. And an extra, extra special thanks to... Babalao, Fisher, and Meowfy. If you would like to become a patron, check the link in the description. Thanks for watching.